Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of These Shadows Podcast. I'm your host, Trip Odenheimer, and today I am joined by Alan Payne. He spent 31 years in the movie rental business. He was the longest lasting blockbuster franchisee, 25 years. He's the author of Built to Fail, the inside story of blockbusters, inevitable bust. Very good book. I can't recommend it enough. I actually have it sitting right here next to me. Sir, welcome to the Shadows Podcast. Great to be here. Thanks. Yeah, I'm excited to get a chance to talk to you. You're located in, correct me if I'm wrong, Austin, Texas? I'm in uh, actually in the small town called Spicewood, which is right outside of Austin, right. which is, uh, I guess it's most famous for being the home of Willie. So, yep, that's right. We talked yeah. about that last yeah. time. Yeah. 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 Okay. And you're, you're right around Longhorn Country, even though you're a Red Raider. I'm, I'm a diehard Red Raider that lives in Longhorn Country, and, it, and it's kind of fun, actually. Yeah, especially right now. It's a good time. I think you got yeah, because basketball. we're better than them in most sports, so that's great. It's great. Yeah, exactly. I think their baseball team's even better, I think, than Texas. Yeah, yeah. Or at least for the past yeah. couple of years, they have been. Yeah. All right, well, first thing before we get going is we're going to go through our five rounds uh, brought to you by one of our partners, Giant Worldwide. Head over to giant.tv forward slash shadows. First question for you. Obviously, got to ask a, a movie-related question question favorite movie genre uh favorite movie genre i i you know i'm i'm into history mm -hmm. so i think i think uh hi historical movies are probably my favorite and they were the most impactful i like a lot of movies but yeah. and i would not be i would not consider myself a movie buff even though i was in the movie business but i've watched a lot of movies but my my favorite are uh, historical movies Favorite historical film? Uh, the most recent one is the one about Winston Churchill uh, uh, leading up to World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm embarrassed, but the name escapes me right now. What? It, oh, it's it's uh, what's the name? I can't even remember the name of it. But it tells the story of of uh, you know Churchill coming to power. And leading up to uh, the beginning of World War II, and the and the, uh, the the movie ends right there, which is kind of disappointing to me because I kind of want to keep going. But, yeah. Uh, Darkest Hour. Yeah, that's it. Darkest, Darkest Hour. Hour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, you know which one I always liked. I'm not sure if how true it is. I'm sure it was, uh, you know, made up a lot for for Hollywood. But the uh, was it the Oliver Stone JFK movie? Kevin I never saw that. But I remember it. I never yep. saw it. Really long. I was, not, I was really not into the whole conspiracy thing. I, mm -hmm. didn't, I, didn't, so I didn't watch it. I probably should have, but I didn't. Oh, I definitely played into it. Definitely yeah. played into it. But all right. Uh, if you could have a job for a day just to try it out, see if you like it, what would it be? Oh, pilot. Pilot. Com commercial pilot. Yep. Yeah, yeah, we talked about that last time. No, Planes. No, no, no question. I'd, I'd love to fly a commercial airplane. Okay. Yeah. What, biggest pet peeve? Uh, biggest pet peeve is uh, uh, intellectual dishonesty mm. uh, in, 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 in politics and business. Yeah. Uh, like, it, it seems like there was a lot of that running through that book. Yeah, I've just... I've just uh, of looking at what appears at least to me to be a fact and just denying it. Yeah. And I, and I, and I see it a lot, you know, uh, probably most often in politics, but, but that, that was the bad, that was the bad political side of business as well. And it seems like the larger businesses get the more political they get, which is, is inevitable. Mm -hmm. but some manage it well and others don't. And Blockbuster didn't. Book recommendation other than yours, because we're going to talk about your book. Well, that's interesting because I just, and I, I, I knew some of these questions and I thought that one might come up. So I'm going to tell yeah. you the one right here. Well, you even had it ready. Yeah, I do because I'm, it, it's, it's called uh, This Naked Mind Control Alcohol. And, uh, I'm not an abuser of alcohol, but, and, and, and I, I don't want to get into why I, I, I read it, but uh, it's, it's, 
it can be applied to so many uh, behavioral things, mm-hmm. and it's and it's uh, it's it's changed a lot of my life for the good. And uh, anybody that is dealing with any sort of uh, addiction uh, or just any kind of behavioral issues, they want to try to understand why they're doing it and how to change it. It's a great place to start. Yeah, I think that's an interesting book, even for someone who's not, like you said, necessarily. Uh, Have you heard of it? I, vague, someone mentioned it a while back because we were talking okay. about uh, something in a classroom and they were talking about how they read that book, even though they they have never had any sort of addiction yeah. to any substance, but it helps them yeah. get inside the mind. Yes. Of, it's, it's easy just to say, stop smoking, stop drinking. Yeah. It's a really great, understand. it's a great story. And the person that did it, uh, that, that wrote the book, her name is Annie Grace. She was a marketing executive and she's completely changed her life trajectory to helping with this issue. And she's got a, she's got a huge movement going on that, that I, th- I think is just fantastic. So mm-hmm. that's the reason I bring that up. Okay. And that'll also be listed along with your book on the book recommendations. Okay site and then last question you probably know this one's coming too we love to ask this one to people i I love to get people's responses dinner for three historical figures who would you have dinner with oh wow with two other people two historical figures you get get three historical figures i get three historical figures oh wow uh oh well one would be who I listed in uh, mentioned in the book, his name was Herb Kelleher, who started Southwest Airlines. Mm-hmm. Uh, no question. That's one. Uh, uh, Ronald Reagan. That's a good one. I would say Ronald Reagan, particularly in today's, I, I would, <laughs> wouldn't it be great to get his take on what's going on? These oh days? my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, he, he was kind of a, he, he's very vocal as well. I haven't followed him. Is he, is he talking about some of this? He's very vocal. Well, yeah. I need, I need to check him out then. Uh, okay. That would be the other one. And, um, let's see. Um, uh, okay. Then I'll, then I'll just, I'll just, th- this may be a cop out, but I'll say Annie Grace, who was, who's the, the author of Naked Mind. Yeah, I, I would. I, she's she's very uh, a self-made person that didn't grow up in a uh, in a situation that you would think would lead to to what she's done. Uh, and I've just come to have great admiration for what she's doing. Uh, yeah. So there's those are the three. Okay, all right. Well, you survived our five <laughs> rounds uh, presented by Giant Worldwide. Now let's dive into your story. Uh, in, in the book, I mean, we can obviously sit here and, and talk just about the book, but uh, one thing I think is really cool about doing this show is, uh, for example, like, you know, we watch the last Blockbuster documentary, we pick up this book and read about it, but find out like a little bit more about you as a person. So talk to us about like your upbringings. Where did you grow up? What did your parents do? Um, I grew up in, 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 in Texas in a, in a small town called Breckenridge, uh, which is, uh, Geographically, it's about 100 miles uh, west of, of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. A very small town of five, 6,000 people um, in, a, in a very conservative uh, baby boomer. My dad was a World War II veteran. Uh, mm-hmm. The first person in his family that graduated from college had a geology degree, moved from Tennessee to make his fortune in, in the oil business, which never happened. Um, And, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't, my dad was a hard worker and the, probably the kindest man I ever met, but he didn't have a whole lot of uh, drive to, you know, to achieve. Um, and in a small town like that, I, I wasn't around, uh, and I've, this is familiar to me because I've talked to my kids about it because they got a completely different upbringing around a lot of successful people, um, so they got exposure to that. I didn't. Uh, mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I graduated from high school, went to Texas Tech, and in many ways was kind of a fish out of water because I was there with a lot of big city kids that had been 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 around uh, successful people, and I hadn't. Uh, and just kind of 
got my way through college and, and, and went to, went to work for a grocery company. Um, cause that's how I put myself through school. My parents didn't have much money. So back then it was, it was not that big of a deal to pay for your school, you know, because it was a lot right. cheaper then than it is now. You can't do that now, but, mm. uh, so I worked in grocery stores and put myself through college and went to work for a company that, that I talk about a lot in the book called yep. HEB. Yeah. Uh, that turned out to probably be the best thing that ever happened to me because they were uh, an exceptionally well-run business that was really kind of starting to try to find its, its footing in, the, in bigger business. They had been more of a family-run operation, still are, but they're, but they're, uh, they're, they're, they're truly idolized kind of as, as one of the best retail organizations in the entire world. And so I got, to, I got exposure to that in their kind of formative years. And competed directly with Blockbuster. And that's, that's how I got into the video business. It was not through a choice of my own. They came to me one day and asked me, uh, I'm get asked me, are you, you hear, hear me? Okay. Cause I got a message here. My video was unstable. So, okay. I can. Yep. Okay. Uh, so, you know, this was 1987 and Blockbuster had just opened its first handful of stores. They had about 30 stores open in the country and uh, HEB decided that it was such a good business and they had a lot owned a bunch of real estate. They'd like to test it and see if, see if they could do that. So they bought out a, a company, uh, a, a company that, that was running video in their stores uh, a guy named, I, named Craig O'Donovich, who I talk a lot about in the book, who, who really taught me the video business. And uh, I understood how to run stores better than he did. So I got, I, I became a part of the organization to run the stores. And uh, it kind of went from there. And, and we took his business model that he had developed and competed with Blockbuster against that. So I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but, but that's kind of where I came from. I, uh, very small town, very, very conservative background going, you know, uh, so that's, that's where I came from. No, that's, that's perfect. I was, I was going to ask too, like while you were at Texas tech or even in high school, what did you see yourself doing? You know how, you know, as kids, <laughs> like I'm going to be a pediatrician in the next 20. What, what did you see yourself doing? Well, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I figured out in high school and I think it was because I didn't have good math teachers, but I was terrible at math. And, uh, but I was a pretty good writer. I could, I mm. could, I could, I could get things on paper pretty well. So I decided I was going to, I was going to major in advertising. Mm. Uh, I got into that and, and because I thought I could do well at it and I could avoid most of math classes in college. Uh, and that eventually turned into a, a, a public relations degree. So that I got out of, uh, I, I graduated from college with a, with a PR degree and a minor in business. And uh, actually because I didn't have a major in business, I had to kind of play some games to actually get an interview with HEB when, when I graduated because they were only, they were only interviewing uh, business uh, candidates. In fact, I, I remember going to the interview rooms because I couldn't sign up and stood outside of an interview room until the interview, he walked out and I walked in and said, I don't have, I couldn't sign up because I don't have a business degree. Would you talk to me? And sat out and it was the, happened to be the VP of human resources. And uh, he liked me and invited me down for a second interview to the offices. And it kind of went from there. But, oh, wow. Uh, yeah. I, I had heard so many good things about HEB from some business professors at tech uh, that I really wanted to talk to them. Yeah. And uh, I had a minor in business and I'd taken a bunch of business classes, but I, I didn't have a major, so I couldn't even sign up. But, but he had an opening and we talked and went from there. I talk about how so, it could have gone different trajectory there. Oh, with yeah. Your career. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I had just gotten married. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I really just needed a job. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking all that much about career traje trajectory, but I'd, I'd worked in several grocery stores during my college years. 
felt like I knew a little bit about the business and uh, kind of talked my way into a, to a job with HEB and got into their uh, management training program and, and, and went from there. So HEB must be like a, a Texas is kind of the hotbed for. for yeah, them. it's the, it's, it's the, uh, that's the only place they operate is uh, in addition to Mexico, they have about 30 stores in Mexico. Uh, but all of their stores in the United States are in Texas, all of them, but they, they dominate, mm-hmm. uh, they absolutely dominate. And, uh, they dominate all of central and South Texas, as well as Houston, which they moved into just about 20 years ago. Uh, so they've gone from nothing to by far the number one grocery chain in Houston in 20 years. And that's a, that's a metropolitan area of seven, eight million people. They're get they're, they're starting to do the same thing in Dallas Fort Worth right now. They've opened their first few stores there and give them, give them a decade, but in 10 years, they'll be the number one, they'll be the number one chain in Dallas as well. Nobody can compete with them. I Texas mean, literally, some gyms. No, nobody can, uh, they, they, they kick everybody's butt. They're just, and you know, the bigger they get, the harder it will be to stay that Mm -hmm. good. Uh, and I hope they do because the, uh, Charles, Butt, who, you know, gets the credit for all of that. He's in his, I think he's about 80 years old now and I, and, and still runs the business. Uh, wow. I guess there's some question as to, you know, when he's gone, how do they, you know, who's going to, who's going to take up the torch. Yeah. Cause he doesn't have any kids. Wow. Yeah. Texas has some, has some gems with H E B and Bucky's and oh. all these. <laughs> you familiar with Bucky's? Oh, I love me some Bucky's. Yeah. I was in one yesterday. Were you? Oh yeah. I love Bucky's. Bucky's is uh, an experience. We have one in, cause they've started to expand now. Like they got one in South Carolina, which is kind of odd, but uh, they, um, just they have one about an hour and a half up the road. So when students come through here, I usually bring them a pack of beaver nuggets. Yeah. And then I'm like, if you haven't been to Bucky's, it's an experience. Cleanest bathroom you've ever seen. Uh, just you get lost. In, it's like Sam's Club of, of yeah. grocery store or of gas stations. But to, to, to a retail junkie like me, the first time I walked into one of those, I, I was just blown away. I mean, yeah. This, this guy, this guy just completely broke the mold and every, all the assumptions about what a gas station can be. He just totally broke the mold. You don't even want to go in another gas station. I know. In, in <laughs> fact, uh, we, we went to the one in, in, in Bastrop, Texas yesterday. And I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, the QT chain it's called, I, I don't yep. even remember. Okay. They're mm-hmm. really, really good at what they do as well, but they yeah. do it on a much smaller scale. There's one of them right across the street from the Bucky's in Bass. And normally mobbed. I and, and I made a point to, to check how many cars were at the gas pumps. And there was probably six. Yeah. At Bucky's, there was at least a hundred. At least a hundred. Those six were because they didn't want to fight with that hundred. Yeah, yeah, probably so. And mm-hmm. and it's it, it's and and I, I you know I kind of feel for the QT guys because they 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 do a really good job of what they do, but they can't compete with that. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of the same way with uh, with HEB. I mean, you can talk of all you want, but if if you're going to open up a traditional grocery store across the street from an HEB, you're going to lose. Yeah, you don't, have a, you don't have a chance. And anybody that's never seen an HEB would not doesn't understand what i'm saying but it's it's a completely different ball game that they run well even in your book you talked about how they were kind of game changers even with like the video rental uh within the stores you were the unit director there and talk to us about the i mean blockbuster passed on an opportunity to buy was it video central yeah yeah because because that's what it was heb video central yeah, the, the interesting thing is, is, you know, all, virtually all, and anybody that's, that, that was around in the 80s and the 90s knows that you didn't just go to Blockbuster or a video store to rent movies. They were everywhere. Oh, mom and pops. Yeah, and so, but, but about a fourth of the business was done in supermarkets. Mm-hmm. 
So the fact that HUB got was renting videos in their grocery stores was not unusual. What was unusual is that they decided to take a step further and open up freestanding stores to compete with Blockbuster and all the other guys. Uh, they were the only, and I think this is really, really important. They were the only retailer that got into that business. The only one, mm. nobody else did. Uh, all of the, all of the freestanding video stores that you saw back in those days were either owned by Blockbuster or some sort of entrepreneurial organization that, that, and there were a few back then, uh, that, that got into the business, but there, none of the traditional retailers said, well, that looks like a great opportunity. Let's get into that. HEB was the only one. Uh, so we were, we were the only video chain back then that actually had the backing of a, of a fully developed retail organization. And that was blended by the entrepreneurial minds of Craig and his team that came, that, that, that joined HEB. So you blended those two things together and, uh, we were on a very small scale, but we were totally dominated, totally dominant in, in the markets that we operated in, it's, you know, right across the street from Blockbuster stores. We just, we just killed them. We were doing two, three times the amount of sales that they were uh, and much more profitable than they were. So we knew that we had a business model that was, that was superior to theirs. And just through some, you know, as I tell the story in the book, Charles Butt decided in, in 1993 that he wanted to get out of the business. And, mm -hmm. and I still don't fully understand why he did because we were, we were very successful and very profitable and it already made him quite a bit of money, but he decided he kind of wanted to get out of that business and focus a hundred percent on, on, the, on his grocery business. So he sold the stores and uh, we had 35 at the time. And those, those 35 stores sold for almost a million dollars a store. Uh, and Blockbuster was not the one that bought them. Uh, Hollywood Video. Yeah, Hollywood, Hollywood Video bought them. And Hollywood Video only had about 15 stores at the time. But, but Mark Waddles, who founded Hollywood Video, had been watching us for several years, knew, knew how successful we were against Blockbuster, and started copying what we were doing. and. Uh, uh, the HEB executive talked to Wayne Heisiger and, uh, and, and, and Steve Berard about buying our stores, who were the, you know, the top two people at Blockbuster at the time. Yep. Uh, they passed, didn't even look at the numbers, were not interested, uh, didn't even get into any serious discussions about, okay, you know, let's look at let's look at some financials and make a make a fully informed, intelligent decision as to whether or not we should buy your stores or not. They just got put off for some reason that's hard to understand. I don't know exactly what it was, but it never even got to a second discussion, and that's what led to Hollywood Video buying the stores. And within five years, uh, uh, Hollywood was just had a thousand stores open and use the purchase of our stores to, to do an IPO uh, and just kind of went from there and, and used a version of our business model to just kick Blockbuster's butt all over the country. And that's what led to Blockbuster's first financial crisis. Uh, and yeah, and I, it's still a mystery to me because Blockbuster knew, or they should have known, how dominant we were in, in Texas against them, but mm -hmm. they were so big and, and growing so fast that, you know, maybe Imagine. Wayne Heisinger who founded Holly didn't even realize, didn't even realize what we were doing to them because even though we were dominating them in some big cities like San Antonio, that was just one big city of many. And it just, maybe it just didn't matter to him. Uh, so he didn't pay any attention to us. And, and that led to, really their first, I think, major, major miss mm -hmm. on competition. And that was one of many. And I know you talk about it in great detail in your book, but what was Video Central and eventually Hollywood Video doing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that was just completely outperforming Blockbuster? Uh, 
uh, it was it was mainly two things. We we uh, we knew that even though a video store carried ten thousand titles or whatever, uh, that that new releases would always be the driver of the business. That's what mm -hmm. brought people into the stores, most people anyway. So we knew that we needed a business model that would make those new releases more available than anybody else. And that may sound simple, but it was very complicated because new releases back then cost almost $70 a piece yeah. uh, in VHS tapes. And, and, the, and the, m most of the life of a, of a new release movie is, is in the first four or five weeks. So you've got to figure out how to make a, a reasonable profit on the, on the rentals of those $70 movies uh, you know, in a very efficient way. We had a much better way of doing that than Blockbuster. We could satisfy more customers and make more money doing it than them. And most of it was because we rented movies for a day at a time. Uh, uh, Blockbuster never changed. They, they, they didn't do that. They thought it was a weakness. Mm -hmm. and for some customers, it was a weakness, but we, we determined very early on that most customers didn't care about keeping it two or three days. They just wanted the movie. Watch and it, that's I know. Hard. Yeah, and that's hard for people nowadays to under comprehend that. But in those days, if you wanted to get a new release, you had to go to a video store. Yeah, and 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 we had them, and Blockbuster didn't. So that was that was a number one. And then secondly, we understood that that a video store could be much more powerful if it if people went there to to do things other than just get new releases. And, and we did, we, we had huge inventories of, of what most people refer to as catalog movies, movies that are more than a year old. And we had a huge inventory of those priced at about a third of what Blockbuster would rent them for. And, and, in, and in so doing, we rented about seven or eight times more of those movies than they did, which created more reasons for keep people to come to our stores over a Blockbuster store. Blockbuster became a new release destination. That was about it. Mm -hmm. They rented some older movies, but not anywhere near the amount that we did. Uh, so that was the formula. And uh, it, it, was, it was kind of in keeping with the grocery industry. It was a high volume uh, approach to the business that Blockbuster never understood we would have to draw, generate more customer traffic just to do the same volume as a Blockbuster store would. They saw that as a weakness. We saw that as a positive. Mm -hmm. uh, and we figured out ways to do it very efficiently. And in so doing, our stores were very efficient and they were fun places to be because they were crowded. Yeah. Uh, on a Friday or Saturday night, you know, you, you, you went to an HEB Video Central store and it was the place to be. You know, there were hundreds of people in those stores on, on Friday and Saturday night. And it was a fun, it was a fun environment. Yeah, for those listeners out there who aren't familiar with it, Friday nights going to a video rental store was like a big deal. And yeah. going in and seeing it and with Blockbuster, yeah, you'd get there on a, on a Friday. And if a copy was out, you wouldn't get it for a couple of days. But you'd go to the... The, I remember the local video stores that had like the horror sections and all that kind of stuff. You go there, it'd be back the next day or it was due back the day of. And you would say, what, when, when's it due back? What time? Yeah. And you'd kind of hang out. And, and Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And that yeah. was, and, that was and, and, you know, the, the, to, to us, it was, very, it was so simple because three fourths of the movie rentals were done on Friday and Saturday. Yeah. Well, if you just kind of do the math, everything went out on Friday for the most part. And in our stores, it came back on Saturday mm -hmm. because most people watched it the day they, they rented it and were fine to bring it back the next day. Blockbusters, they, they, they rented it. If you rented it on Friday, you didn't have to bring it back till Sunday or Monday in some cases. Yeah. So you would go in a Blockbuster store on a Saturday night and there was literally nothing there on the new release wall, nothing. Mm -hmm. And we would be full. Uh, and, and like you said, there would be people coming in. It, it, if the movie wasn't there, they knew it would probably be there within a matter of minutes if they just hung around. Watch the Dropbox. Yeah, yeah. And in most cases, we'd have somebody at the counter pulling that stuff out and handing it to customers as it was coming in. Yeah. 
it was it was uh, it was a it was a turnover game, and uh, to keep that stuff moving, and and Blockbuster just never comprehended that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and well, talk to us about how you ended up at Blockbuster. Well, the you know when Charles decided to sell the stores, I had a I had a decision to make: was I going to go back to the grocery business, what I, which I you know obviously joined them for, or was I going to stay in the video rental business, which I'd really come to really enjoy uh, for a lot of reasons, but a lot of it was because we got to call our own shots. You know, we were, we were, we were literally running the business. Uh, we were just using HEB's money to run a business. Uh, we had very little interaction with, with executives at, at HEB unless we wanted to unless we wanted to they didn't tell us much of anything or what to do we we ran our own show and i'd come to really appreciate the ability to make your own decisions and do your own stuff so and it just so happened that a blockbuster franchisee called me up it was just a total coincidence uh some people that my older brother knew uh and they had met me through them through him and they they called me up and asked me if i'd like to talk about running their stores. Uh, so long story short, I talked to him and, and, and determined that that was a better direction for me to go than staying at HUB. So that's how I wound up. I, wa- I didn't own the stores, but I ran the stores for, for a company called Prime Video that owned a bunch of cable TV uh, uh, systems. And they didn't really know what they were doing in the retail business. They were great cable television operators, but they were just kind of following the blockbuster playbook in, in video stores. And, and it, it wasn't working out for them because they were in some very competitive markets and just even in Alaska, which turned out to be the longest surviving uh, blockbuster market that, that we owned. Uh, in, in, In fact, except for the last store in, in Oregon. Yeah the the stores in alaska were the last ones to close yet yet in 1993 prime was having a hard time with those stores uh so they hired me to do that and what i did is i i knew that that heb had a better business model for the business so uh i i looked at it as a great opportunity to, to combine the the blockbuster brand which clearly was the national leader with a better business model and that's what we did. And within, within three or four months after we had in, installed all of our programs, we were the fastest growing franchise chain in the system mm-hmm. by far, not even close. And that's when I, I got to be so surprised that Blockbuster, even though we weren't the biggest franchise at, at the time, we, had, we, we got up to 40 stores. But uh, they just never paid any attention to what we were doing. And we would win these awards for all these achievements and stuff, particularly sales growth, but nobody ever wanted to ask us why, you know, how it was happening. So uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was just part of what I would, you know, the learning with Blockbuster Management over the years is they just had no interest in what anybody else was doing other than what was going on, you know, in their you know, ivory towers, if you want to say it, they, they just didn't, they didn't have, they didn't want any exposure to other ideas. Yeah. In your book, there was a, a line where you mentioned someone It's basically their philosophy was like, if it's not invented here, not interested. Yeah. And how was that when you would try to talk to, I know you said you had very limited interactions with a lot of the CEOs there, but when you would have these meetings with people and you're like, you know, hey, we should probably try this. This is proven. This has worked in the past elsewhere. How do those conversations typically go? You know, it was it was uncomfortable because. I looked at the business so differently than how they did mm-hmm. and in such more detail than they did. Uh, it was hard to have. And I don't say this to condescendingly but it, it was it was it was it was difficult to have an intelligent conversation about the video business with them right because they were running it on such a thirty thousand foot level that you couldn't talk to them intelligently about what was going on in a store mm-hmm. and and i and to me 
even though Blockbuster had 9,000 stores, their success was built one store at a time. You know, the only way that was going to be successful is if each store was being well run. And they just never looked at it that way. So, you know, it was, it was very hard for me to have a discussion with them about what we were doing. I would tell them what we were doing, but because they didn't even understand it at that level, the discussion would just kind of stop. Mm-hmm. And, and to me, these were elementary things about turnover and, 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 and price relationship to rents and, and customer count and customer frequency and, and, and rents per visit and all these things that we looked at as, as, a, as a compilation of everything that made the business. Uh, they just didn't want to talk about it at that level of detail. And, and to me, I don't care if they were the CEO or whatever. It was not a complicated business and they needed to be interested in it at that level. Yeah. And they were not, they just were not. I, you know, I tell a story about John Antioca going into our stores in Alaska and we're standing in a store that literally rents 10 times more movies than a typical blockbuster store. And I told him that it was like, it just went right over his head. It's like, so, you know, I, I, it's got to be frustrating. Yeah. I don't, I, and I, it's like, what else? I don't know what else to say. The store looked totally different than a blockbuster store. It's got four t- times the inventory in it. It's got five times more customers in it than any blockbuster store, uh, than an average blockbuster store. Yet he doesn't, he doesn't have any interest in how all that happens. You know, do, do you think it, a lot it, of that had to do with the fact that you came over from like HEB? Do you think it was a, uh, okay, we get it. That worked over there. Or, or do you think they were just, you know, working at a ma- such a macro view of things? You were so micro with how things were run day in and day out. Or do you think it was that outsider label? It was a combination of both, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they looked at competition as somebody to either ignore or buy. Mm. Uh, they had they had determined that they didn't want to buy our stores at HEB. Therefore they were just going to ignore them. Uh, and as I told them at the time, I said, you, you realize that video, uh, uh, Hollywood video just bought the stores and it was, and, and had gone public. So it was yeah. not like this was some little outfit that didn't have access to capital. It was somebody that they needed to pay attention to. They had, they, they had Wall Street support. They had money to grow. You need to know what they're doing. And they're, do, they're running a, 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 a store that has a very similar business model to what i have been running for the last seven years. I said it to them just like that. You need to under, try to understand what they're doing. You're going to need to understand how to respond to it. And I'll never forget, as I tell the story in the book, I'm telling that story to the vice president of, 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 uh, of franchising. And he looked at me squarely in the eye and said, you're not there anymore. You're with Blockbuster. You need to forget all that. And I'm going, okay. And that, and that, and literally that was the response I got from anybody I talked to at Blockbuster. They just didn't care. They just didn't care. And, you know, it was a, it was a case of most of those people that got into the business in those years had made so much money. I mean, think about it. Wayne Heisinger bought Blockbuster for $16 million and sold it eight years later for almost 9 billion. Yeah. He had waste management. So right these are guys. That. Yeah. Yeah. He, 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 he made his initial fortune in waste management, uh, took the proceeds of that and all these other partners and financial backing that he had and, and, and bought Blockbuster for $16 million and uh, built it into, you know, a dominant brand. And, and, you know, I don't want to ever minimize in what he did. I mean, it right. was fabulous what he did. Nobody else had the foresight to do what he did, but he didn't, he didn't have a whole lot of interest in the operations of the business. It was just, it was just a means to make a whole bunch of money. Was he the one behind the award show and the blockbuster bowl game and, you know, maybe launching a theme park? 
Well, the theme park, he was obviously behind. He, mm -hmm. he, uh, Blockbuster was so profitable in those days that they literally could not, they had more money than they could spend on opening new stores. So they got, they started getting into other businesses, a lot of different businesses. And the most interesting one was where they bought a bunch of land to, to build Blockbuster World that was going to compete with Miami, Disney right? World. Yeah, it was somewhere in, in, in Florida. I'm not sure where. But the whole idea was to take this massive Blockbuster juggernaut brand and, and just continue to expand into other entertainment businesses, one, one of them being theme parks. And of course, Heisinger and Rock. The blockbuster was not what they thought it was. It was uh, it was not a cash flow juggernaut like they thought. It was a uh, it was it was already crippled mm -hmm. and, and and declining. And uh, all those businesses that blockbuster had had dabbled in that all went away. Uh, all all that stopped. In fact, what you mentioned the blimp and the card and all those things that actually came later after Heising had had left. Was that more Bill Fields? Uh, he, he got rid of video, right? And he just made it blockbuster and wanted to go more. Well, he didn't get rid of video. He just he just shrunk it. Uh, Bill well, Fields, from the name, he just became blockbuster after that, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the name, you're exactly right. He, uh, that was, you know, when, when, when Wayne Heisinger sold the company to Viacom, his uh, second in command, Steve Berard, ran it for about a year and then left. And things were not going well at all. So Vacom hired who was probably the most sought after retail executive in the country at the time. His name was Bill Fields and he was the number two guy at Walmart. Mm -hmm. um, so we all assumed that that was a great hire, but Bill Fields didn't understand the rental business. You know, he had grown up in a mass merchant environment. We thought that he should be able to adjust to that, you know, just look at the numbers. But he, he didn't believe in the rental business. He knew that it was the cash cow that would keep Blockbuster going for a while. But he, he believed the business was going to need to transition to something else very quickly. Uh, we didn't believe that at all. And, and in fact, the business actually got kind of reborn with the with the a transition to DVD, which came right after Bill Fields came in and left. Uh, but yeah, he, he shrunk the rental departments in, in blockbuster stores and brought in all kinds of other products, all of which had been tried before. And we knew they wouldn't sell, mm -hmm. but he had to try it for himself. And again, it didn't sell. Uh, uh, he got into music and t-shirts and, you know, blockbuster stores can dabble in that, but it's not, and, and it's still some of it, but it's, but it's not a consistent line of business for a rental store. People don't go there for, to buy those kind of things. And he was convinced he could attract those kind of customers and he never did. And in fact, nobody ever did. Nobody yeah. ever did. Anybody that tried to turn a video store into anything other than primarily a video store failed. It would be like, somebody trying to take a movie theater and turn it into something else. You know, yeah. that's not why people go there. People mm -hmm. came to video stores to rent movies and buy snacks. And that was about it. And you could, you could sell a few other things, but not much. I remember there was a blockbuster. Uh, gosh, this must've been like 2009, 2010. That was in Tucson. And I remember going in there and the whole left-hand side was like merchandise. Yeah. And, <clears throat> All of this stuff, that, and then like the right hand side was the video rentals, and then you had to keep right. by the register. But I just thought it was kind of odd that you can go in there and get a, a print from a movie in there. That, well, not even necessarily movies, like video games and stuff. But it was yeah. it was interesting. But talk to us about um, yeah. you know one of the the big things that will or probably a misconception that a lot of people have is that well Netflix was what killed Blockbuster. But actually, there was there was like a lot more that went into it. There was DVDs not being up to date, with not transitioning VHSs out, bringing in DVDs, right. uh, and, and then also everything with with yes, the infancy of Netflix and Redbox. But talk to us about how things just started to kind of 
crumble there at the end, uh, mainly starting, I guess, with the DVDs and then the, the lack of updating the, uh, the system to update. All yeah. Um, boy, it, it's, it's, it's layer upon layer upon layer yeah. of, of, of mistakes and, and failure to, to improve as you go along. But, um, this this is this is where John Antiaco becomes part of the story, and and he came over he, from Taco Bell, right? Yeah, he he, well his 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 retail training was primarily in Seven Eleven. He had been with Seven Eleven for twenty years, and had and had was successful there, and had <clears throat> and had been CEO of like three different retail organizations very briefly. The last one being uh, Taco Bell. Uh, and and the the Bill Phils experiment was obviously a complete disaster. He he was at Blockbuster for for less than a year, <laughs> and and uh, by mutual agreement, which really means he got fired. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Sumner Redstone, who ran Viacom, uh, got rid of him about a year after he got there, and and hired John Antiaco in 1997. And, and 1997 is a, is a watershed year for the entertainment business because not only did John Antiaco join who was, you know, it's hard for people to understand the dominance of Blockbuster, but, do, but Blockbuster was the most powerful uh, entertainment organization in the country in 1997. As broken as they were underneath it, you know, to the average person just looking at what was going on, there was more people in a blockbuster store than were in the theaters every week. I mean, it was it was that dominant. Uh, but that was the same year when John John came in and took over the company as CEO uh, and chairman as well. Uh, that that DVD was being introduced by the studios to replace VHS. It was also the same year that, that Reed Hastings recognized that was an opportunity to start mailing movies through to, to, to homes instead of people going to stores to get them because DVD was small enough you could do that. You couldn't do it efficiently in a, with a VHS. People had mm -hmm. tried it, but it didn't work. It was just too big and too expensive to mail. But he, he immediately recognized... Uh, the opportunity and started a business called Netflix and started mailing DVDs. And, you know, for the first few years, it was kind of insignificant. Uh, so those events are what kind of started the, the massive transition that would happen over the next decade, all of which was under the tutelage of John Antiaco, who stayed with the company until 2007. He was there for 10 years. And, and all of these major, major transitions uh, happened during those 10 years. The transition to DVD, Netflix eventually starting to stream movies in 2007. Mm -hmm. And then the, the ret kiosk comes along and where you can rent movies from a vending machine in 2004. Uh, so all this happened while John Antiaco is there. Uh, so the also business... the 50 million, the $50 million. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, in, in, Three years after Netflix had started, they they had become you know they were still a very very small company, but mm -hmm. but they had they were growing fast enough that people were starting to take them seriously. But in fact, they were growing so fast they were running out of money. And you probably remember the dot com crash uh, when the financial markets dried up. Netflix was was growing fast, needed capital. And there weren't, there wasn't any. Mm -hmm. uh, so they started looking for people to buy them. And, you know, the obvious, the obvious uh, uh, target was Blockbuster. So they have this meeting in Dallas with, uh, of course, John Antiaco, as he tells a story, he was not in the meeting, but he walked through and said hello to Hastings and the other people that were there at the time. Uh, but this was in 2000. Netflix had a quarter of a million subscribers, which compared to Blockbuster's 30 or 40 million was not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. But what is key to that whole equation is that DVD was in its infancy. 
it was, it was, it only had about a five, 10% market penetration at the time. So if you just did the math and Netflix continued to grow at the rate they were growing, you could easily see where they were going to have five to 10 million subscribers if they just kept up with, with DVD growth. Uh, so they should have been taken seriously, even though they were small. But just as HEB did with us, at, at H, at, uh, just as Blockbuster did with HEB a few years earlier and a lot of other companies, they couldn't get their arms around why Netflix was a threat. So they never had a, they never had a serious discussion about buying them. And they could have bought the company for $50 million. Mm. And... And on top of that, Reed Hastings wanted to join. It's not like he wanted to sell it and leave. He wanted to stay on to run the buy mail part of the business and let Blockbuster run the store part of the business. Yeah. Uh, but Blockbuster passed. Netflix, uh, although they were running out of money, they, they downsized and eventually went public. They were not public at the time. They, they launched an IPO. The company was valued at, I think, somewhere around $100 million by then. And the, kind of the rest is history. Uh, they became the darling of Wall Street, had access to all the capital they needed to keep growing. And within a few years, uh, you know, they were, they were not just a small threat. They became a big threat. And, of course, as, Hast as Reed Hastings said all along, the plan was never to be a permanent dvd renter they were going to get into streaming and that's obviously what they eventually did yeah i think you even put in the book that's why they're called netflix and not dvd by mail yeah dot com yeah, they, yeah hey well i think everybody knew at the time that that uh you know again this is hard for people to comprehend but back then there was not enough broad there was not enough bandwidth to yeah. stream movies so it wasn't an option uh, but we all knew that it would be eventually just nobody knew when. And, uh, so anybody in the business at the time had to have their eye on the future of what the internet was going to be to, to movie watching in home, in the homes anyway. And, uh, Blockbuster was never a leader in that. They just watched everybody else mm -hmm. and didn't even do a very good job of that. Well, Blockbuster tried some stuff. They had the movie pass, DVD by mail. They tried the, I, I know you love the no late fees. Uh, oh. <laughs> but they tried all these different strategies. And then uh, I think in the last Blockbuster documentary, they talked about how basically they were almost competing, found themselves competing with Netflix in this DVD by, by mail. We also have the store you can return the movies in. But it eventually just came down to 2008, the, the financial crisis, just not a lot more capital. Netflix ended up doing what a lot of, uh, you know, successful companies have done. I think they downsized by like 30 percent, um, which gave them that capital to, to kind of keep going. Um, but talk to us about your uh, you, you mentioned the stores in Alaska. The, the mm -hmm. I have to ask about the whole Russell Crowe um, memorabilia. Well, that was, that was one of the fun stories. And of course it, unfortunately it came at the end. Right. But, but uh, yeah, our stores were in the reason we called our company border entertainment is that our stores were in Alaska as well as the border of, of Texas. So our stores were along the border of Mexico and Canada. Uh, so we called it border, but anyway, our best stores for the most part, we're in Alaska. Alaska is a great place for retailing. Uh, and the, so the, the, the last stores were closing in Anchorage and, uh, and uh, Fairbanks. And just through, I don't know what started it, but, but uh, a guy by name, an entertainer by the name of John Oliver, who, mm -hmm. who is on, I guess it's HBO, right? Yep. Uh, I think he still has this show of, uh, I forget the name of it, but it was running on Sunday night and it's a comedy show, kind of a news comment, commentary comedy show. And he comes up with this idea that he's going to try to save the, one of the last blockbuster stores. And this happened to be the one in Anchorage. And he 
tells this story about how he bought all this, this Russell Crowe memorabilia from his divorce uh, settlement and doesn't say what he's going to do with it. And all of a sudden pops up with this idea that, hey, we want to give this to the last blockbuster store in Alaska to try to save the store. And uh, I'm not watching the show. So I start getting phone calls at midnight, you know, with, did you see this? And long story short, it was, it was difficult to, to find out how to contact them, but we eventually got a hold of them and, and it was all legit. So they gave us uh, a bunch of memorabilia that, that was from, that they were basically props that Russell Crowe had used in several of his movies, including a jock strap that he used in, 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 a, in Cinderella Man that became a story. And um, so we put all that in, on display in Alaska in, in, that, in that store in, in Anchorage and got a lot, a huge amount of publicity over it. But as I told the producer of the show, I said, I don't think this is going to save us. So don't be surprised if we close the store shortly thereafter. And sure enough, we'd already had plans to close it. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were still profitable, but we knew the sales trajectory was such that we weren't going to be able to stay profitable for very long. So we had already set a date to close. And so we put, we put all that in there, some beautiful glass cases that they sent us and, uh, and it created a whole lot of buzz and a lot of, and a lot of additional visits, but it didn't save the business. So, so when we closed our last store, we gave all that, didn't give it, it's on loan to the, to the store in, in Bend, Oregon, mm. which, is the, which is the, you know, the last legendary blockbuster now. So all that memorabilia is still on display in that store. I was imagining walking into your house and seeing like Russell Crowe. I don't have it yet. I don't have it. <laughs> He's, it's, it's still there. And when he closes, I'll, I'll get it back. And I don't know what I'm going to do with it. But yeah. it's, uh, it's uh, we gave the jock strap back to uh, the Russell Crowe show because they used it for a bit later on, but we kept everything else. So we've got the, the robe that he wore in the ring and Cinderella Man, as well as a vest he wore on in Les Miserables and a couple of other things. So it, it's I gave the right piece back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How, how did that feel when you you finally, you know, turned off the lights, locked the door to your final store, like seeing kind of the, everything from your block, but actually from starting off at HEB all the way to, to then just it's yeah full story. Well, I'd been in the video business, you know, since 1980. Well, technically from, if you go back to when I was running HEB stores, we were renting videos in the, in the store. So you could, you could take that all the way back to the early eighties, which was, which predated Blockbuster. This was mm -hmm. before Blockbuster even existed. To go from that all the way to the end to where, when we closed our last store in, in Alaska, there was the one store left in Bend, Oregon, and there was a small franchise chain left in Australia. That was it. That was all that was left. And since then, the Australia chain closed and the, and the, and the last store is there. So, you know, when you're, when, I think when you're going through shutting a business down and trying to do it, uh, in a financially sound way, so you don't break yourself, as well as providing jobs for all the people that helped you do it. Mm -hmm. You know, you 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 try to stay unemotional, uh, I guess, emotionally detached from it, and just try to make the right calls as you go through it because it's all tough. But yeah. you're trying not to show it, you know, because <laughs> uh, you don't want to demoralize the troops. But uh, I remember, I remember when I close when when I went up to Alaska for the last time and I haven't been back, I, I plan to go back at some point, but I haven't been back since. Um, leaving those last stores and going through all the, you know, the, the, the process of shutting them down and going to the airport and realizing, wow, this is the last time. Uh, and 30 year history of the video business just ended. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, yeah, it, it, you know, it's like, it's like you're, you're going through this process of trying to do it right. And then it all just hits you upside the head of, wow, it's over, it's over. And, uh, uh, I didn't know what I was going to do at that point. Didn't know I was going to write a book. And, uh, so yeah, and I, I remember just kind of breaking down at the airport and 
call up my wife and just, you know, just talking through it. It was, it was hard. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, it's one of the, it's one of the reasons that we always told Blockbuster, you know, you know, you don't take us very seriously because, um, you know, we're small and maybe we don't understand your corporate perspective on the business, but what we did bring to it is, is that we were, we were financially invested in it and it was our money that we stood to lose if we didn't run it right. So we may not understand it from your perspective, but you'd need to understand it from our perspective as well, because uh, this is our life. And, and if it fails, we're broke. I mean, I put two kids through college where they wanted to go uh, with the video business. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and as well as, you know, having a decent life for myself and my family. So it's, 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 it's just, it's much more personal when you own a business for yourself, totally, much more personal. Yeah. I, um, I, the, the parallels between your story about blockbuster and even what I've seen in my career, um, are, are crazy in terms of, you know, when I go back to my job in the military, uh, working with computers, I'm going to be out of my career for about six years, seven years. I'm going to be a senior non-commissioned officer. I know when I go back, I'm going to need to listen to the youngest person in the work center, the people who are out doing the job every single day and not just see it from a, well, I'm writing packages and I'm going to meetings. Uh, so yeah. it's, it's reading that that's just what really stood out to me was so many times throughout my life, not just in the military, but having leaders that don't necessarily listen to, to those that yeah. work with them and, you know, that are, that are getting down and dirty every day doing the job. Um, so it, it, like I said, phenomenal book with that. We're going to get to the book, but what did you think of the uh, last blockbuster documentary, which ironically enough was on Netflix it still is on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it's uh it's really as much the story of, of Sandy Harding who runs the last blockbuster story. It's, it's, it's that as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, a friend of mine, Ken Tisher owns the store, but, but you know, he, he pretty much leaves it to Sandy on how to run it. So uh, it's a, you know, it's a great story. Uh, she would tell you that that store is not, a real blockbuster store now as you would typically see it because uh, a lot of their businesses is, is novelty things that people go there to buy like like the shorts you showed me a while ago yeah yeah uh, uh, they sell a lot of those kind of things they still rent movies uh, but not near as many as they used to uh, but you know it's it's a great story in fact I don't know if you know but but Netflix is going to launch a uh, uh, a sitcom about the last blockbuster store later this year it's in production right now i think i've heard that somewhere yeah i think i have yeah. um and and you know i'm disappointed that they're doing it without the benefit of talking to me or ken who owns the last store yeah we haven't heard from anybody so i, I guess it's just a vehicle on how they're going to tell funny stories from the 90s or what. i'm not sure what, exactly what it is but i've always thought that uh, and, and I've talked to a lot of other people that feel, have the same feeling that that you could you could set up a, a, a show, a, a, a series in a, in a blockbuster store and have a lot of fun with it. And that's that's what they're that's what they're planning to do. How do you feel seeing all the the nostalgia blockbuster stuff out there? Uh, well, I look at it, it, I guess, different reasons. I, 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 lo I love it because I've got the book out, which, mm -hmm. which uh, tells me that people are still interested. Uh, there's a, you know, there's, there's a lot of, I guess, uh, it, it, as a guy that read the book, he said, I got real melancholy reading it, you know, uh, kind of missed, missed opportunities. So anytime Blockbuster comes up, I think of, of, not only failure, but in my opinion, failure that was unnecessary. It was yeah, going to be really, missed opportunities. Yeah, it was going to be really, really difficult for Blockbuster or any company in that situation to transition. But they never gave themselves a chance. And 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 you know, you you mentioned this. That Netflix is getting ready to go through something very similar right now. Mm -hmm. In fact, in fact, 
I'll read a headline a couple of weeks ago, is Netflix going to be the next blockbuster? Well, that's kind of the thing. It, f- blockbuster is synonymous with failure, not success. As big as they were and as dominant as they were, the, the theme of blockbuster is they failed. And that's why I wrote the book, to try to explain from my perspective why that happened. Netflix has got some of the same challenges right now. They, they, were, they were first to do what they did. They got access to a whole lot of content from the studios at bargain prices because they, they were underestimated. Now that's being taken away from them and they're having to create all their own stuff. And they're just another studio now. Yeah. Not, not quite yet, but it's, that's coming. They're just going to be another studio that's trying to stream their content. Uh, so how will they adjust to that? Mm-hmm. Will they, will, you know, there, there's, there's no way they're going to be as dominant going forward as they have been over the last 10 years. So where are they going to find their place in there? Uh, and not, and not make, they, they can't stay a super phenomenal high growth company. It's not there anymore. So they're going to have to make some adjustments and will they do it successfully or will they not? Blockbuster is one of the greatest examples of a company that didn't. There's yeah. a lot of companies that have, uh, uh, you know, as one of my, I, I, I brought up uh, a Herb Kelleher earlier. Southwest Airlines went from nothing to the company that they still are. They, they've been able to do it and sustain it. Uh, they're not a high growth company anymore, but they're still the dominant air, domestic airline in the, in the right. United States. Uh, so they figured out a way to do it. We'll see if Netflix can do it. Yeah, because Netflix, I mean, now there's HBO's got their own yeah. uh, originals. You got Hulu, you've got, I mean, Disney, Amazon Prime. Disney, Disney's been the big threat. Dis- oh, Disney. Yeah, and yeah. for like $6 a month, and yeah. they're bundled with the ESPN and everything. Yeah, it's yeah. it's yeah. going to be interesting. That's a, that's a very valid point. Now, talk to us about your book. Like I said, I've, I've read it. I loved it. I thought it was a great <laughs> business book. Uh, like you said, missed opportunities almost every chapter, it seems like. Uh, what made you decide to write a book and tell our listeners like where they can find it? Uh, well, it, 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 it kind of started with, a, I think, a combination of I didn't know what I was going to do when the stores were closed. And I'd always had this idea that, uh, you know, this story needs to be told and it mm-hmm. hadn't been told. And, and because... Blockbuster had five different CEOs. There wasn't really anybody in a position to, to tell the story from beginning to end. And uh, just my longevity gave me a, I gave, I had a perspective on it from beginning to end. And obviously was very frustrated through the years at, 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 at how Blockbuster ran the business. Uh, so just through some discussions with, family and some franchise friends uh, decided that, yeah, I really want to do this. And I started exploring how to do it. I'm not the kind of person that can go to the random house and get a, you know, a, a deal. So uh, I did like a lot of people do now. They, they go to these companies that, that, that will help you do it. And I chose a company called Scribe Media, which is just a great organization. Uh, and they happen to be based in Austin, but that's not why I chose them. And, and I wrote it all, but they helped me every step of the way with the, with the editing and the, and the design of the book and, and all that. And uh, so it, it came out just over a year ago mm-hmm. and it's, you know, it, it became an Amazon bestseller very quickly. And that doesn't mean it made me rich or anything because it didn't. Uh, but, uh, it's, it's continuing to sell. They're still, in fact, April, this past April was the best month I've had since it came out. So there's still a lot of interest in it. And did you ever uh, put your finger on what that was? What was it? I don't, I don't know. There was a little bit of banner in social media about some issues uh, that might've done it, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, but you know, the most satisfying thing to me about it is that, uh, after I, after I wrote it, and, and I've had a lot of franchise friends read it. I've had a lot of corporate, corporate people read it. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
all the feedback except for a very, very small amount has been positive. And most important to me, nobody's challenged me on any of it. Uh, I think it's, I think it's well-researched. Obviously I have some opinions in there, but they're all based on fact. And I, mm -hmm. and I, I don't, uh, I don't know that they're, I would challenge anybody to read it and dispute. Uh, they may dispute my conclusions, but they can't dispute the facts of the story. Because that stood out to me. It, wa it wasn't sour grapes. It was more, no, let's, let's apply some logic to this. This is yeah. the numbers. Yeah. So as, a, as of right now, it's, it's the only uh, documentation of blockbuster video from beginning to end. And, and it, very likely will be the only one. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of articles written about Blockbuster, but nobody's written a book about it to tell the whole story from beginning to end. Uh, so it's the only one in print that, that tells it and very likely will be the only one ever. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's very satisfying to think that that I that, you know, I put, I, I, I had the guts and the determination to actually do it. Uh, when nobody else has done it and probably, probably nobody else will. And I think it really is, as time moves on, it becomes, I don't think it becomes a less relevant story. I think it's a, mm -hmm. it, it's, inc it's incredibly relevant story to how, and we haven't mentioned this, but I think Blockbuster is probably one of the greatest examples of a phenomenally successful startup that never transitioned to being a good operating company. Blockbuster was never a well-managed company. They were a greatly managed startup that took the country by storm. But but they from if you if you get into digging into how they ran the business, you know, they were terrible at it. Terrible. There was not much that they did in running a video store that was that was exceptional. It was okay, but that's about about the only thing you can say for it. It was not exceptional. Yeah, we actually talked about this before we hit record, but there's still a line from your book: Te "Technology did not kill Blockbuster. Blockbuster killed Blockbuster." Yeah, and the and the proof is that Blockbuster was financially dead before Blockbuster ever streamed a movie. So mm -hmm. you, you can argue with my my conclusion, but the fact is is that technology was not a threat to Blockbuster, uh, you know, before they were, before they were gone. I mean, they were in, not, in 2007 when, uh, well, Blockbuster filed bankruptcy in 2010 mm -hmm. to put all this in perspective. They filed bankruptcy in 2010. Now they had been financially broken for several years before that, but they finally just got forced into bankruptcy. Right. Netflix streamed their first movie in 2007. And really, it was at least four or five years later before streaming was even a significant factor in the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. uh, and Blockbuster was dead by then. So, yeah. uh, you know, there, there's, there's no way that you can look this story of Blockbuster and say technology killed it. It's just not true. It's just not true. You just, just look at the, at the timeline. Yeah, I think you you summed it up best earlier. Just yeah. missed opportunities, yeah, all the way through in in management um, from the top. What when the pandemic struck in two thousand twenty? Is this when you really had time to knock out this book, or how did how did you manage that time? You well, no longer it, had it, the stores. It well, the the last store closed in August of two thousand eighteen. Uh, we had some kind of finish up stuff to do, and uh, so I was a little busy with that, but was starting to research the book. And I guess I didn't start writing the book until uh, 2019. Well, I started really, really researched and hard in 2019. And yeah, I started writing it about the time the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it was published in March of 2021. So yeah, I was I was riding it through the pandemic. So I guess in a, in a strange way that actually helped. Yeah, it helped it helped me dedicate the time to do it. Yeah. So what? Another thing our, our listeners are probably curious of: what have you been up to now? Uh, trying trying to uh, kind of figure out if I want to work more or not, and I've kind of decided I don't. <laughs> so so. Uh, 
you know, I, the, the book has only been out a year and mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time, you know, marketing it and watching it and trying to figure out, okay, how, how's it going to sell and where am I going to go from here? So that's, that was just a year ago. So I'm still kind of, you know, stepping back and observing all that and trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. But it's, I'm 69 years old. Uh, I'm young for my age. I don't, I don't, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to play a little bit more. So that's probably what I'm going to do. Yeah. Well, what do you want your legacy to be when people mention Alan Payne? I, this is going to be a two part question. When they mention you 50 years from now, grandchildren talking about you 50 years from now, what do you want them to say about you? Oh, wow. Well, that gets into a whole different level of stuff, you know, uh, <laughs> That's not about business. That's, that's about, uh, uh, wow. I, you know, I, I, I just, I guess I just want to be known as somebody that, 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 uh, used the tools I, I was, I had and, and did the best I could and, and was kind to people along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's really all, yeah. uh, and, and, uh, and, and I, and I'm, I really am given, given the background I came from, and I've told my kids this, uh, you know, my parents didn't have any money and anything that I ever had, I, I had to earn for myself. Like most people from, from my generation, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, there's a lot more wealth around now than there was back then. And I, so I, I wasn't an unusual case. I wasn't poor, but I didn't have any money to do anything. Uh, so the fact that, I managed to take that and, and of course we didn't even talk about, but I eventually bought the stores I was running and, and, and I did manage to make a little money in some difficult times and, and, and was, was able to put my, I took my, my, my son, you went to university of Colorado and later got an MBA. My, my, my daughter who, who got interested in the movie business. I don't know if it was because of me, but, but got into USC, uh, uh, cinematic art school and, and, and graduated from there with a double major in four years. And it's a big and, deal and, and cinema as well as, as marketing. Uh, and I was able to pay their way the whole way and told them, you wow. know, my wife and I told them, you know, that it, you know, you do your job, we'll do ours. Uh, we don't expect you to work, you know, go to school, do the absolute best you can at it and, and we'll pay for it. And anybody that's ever put, any anybody that's looked at the, at the prices of education now knows how much money that was. That yes. was a, <laughs> it was hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And I and 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 I told my daughter not too long ago of, of all my accomplishments. That's that's probably right up there in the top of being able to to give them the opportunity to do that uh, that I didn't get. They. They got to choose their school exactly where they wanted to go for what they wanted to learn. And, and they knew it was going to be paid for. And they both had done really, really well. So that's, uh, that's great. That's, that's. There's your legacy right there. I mean, that's good enough. That's yeah, good enough. exactly. That's good, that's, that's good enough. I, I wish I could, hopefully I can say the same with, with my daughter in, in a couple of years. So that's kudos to you for that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. They want to find your book. Where can you point them? To? Uh, well, it's 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 probably in a, in a few independent bookstores around the country, but I, I the, 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 most books are sold on Amazon now, so that's where you go. You you can also find it uh, on any any internet book selling website, uh, but most of the sales go through Amazon, as with all books nowadays. Yeah, that's actually where I get most of my books from as well. So I, that's actually where I got a copy of it. Uh, at the time of recording, it's already available on the uh, book recommendation site on the shadows podcast.com. Uh, sir, what final comments do you have for our listeners? Uh, just, you know, if you're, if I, I wrote, I wrote the book to be accessible to anybody I think that's interested in a, in a, in a, in a good business story. It's, it's, it's a business book, but it's not written like a business book. Mm -hmm. uh, and my, my whole intention was, I know that a lot of people have these nostalgic memories of blockbuster. And maybe if you want to know the business business side of it, 
uh, it's not a difficult book to read. Uh, I don't think, and it, and yeah, there's some numbers in there, but it, but it's, it's, it's really told in story form. And, and I think maybe the biggest compliment I've got on it is that it's, it's accessible to people that are not necessarily interested in reading, reading business books. And uh, so that I'm proud of that perspective of it too. Yeah, the nostalgia piece is always huge for me. I, I think when I first talked to you, I was telling you, I, I remember Friday nights going out, getting dinner with the family, and then we would head over to Blockbuster, rent a movie. And that was that was a huge part of my childhood. So I see the the blue yeah. ticket stub with the the yellow on it, and it just uh, brings back so many memories of, of being a child and, and doing those things with, with my yeah. parents. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely go pick up a copy of the book, folks. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Like you said, it's, it's not a, you pick up a lot of business books and I'm big into a lot of business books and some of them go way over my head and there's no worse feeling than getting about four or five chapters in. And I'm like, I, I can't, I can't finish this one. I, yeah. Yeah. I was not a higher up at this company, but uh, this was a, a really good book to s- just sit down and read and just see how, I mean, even, even growing up, I was like, man, Botbuster is super successful for all these. But then you really get to see like the foundation was just crumbling Yeah. Um, right before us. So awesome read. Uh, I can't thank you enough for taking time to do this. Uh, greatly appreciate it. And folks, that is going to conclude this episode of the Shadows Podcast.